there is a conscious brain, there is a subconscious brain. What you've learned in the meantime is that we have beliefs, we have values, we have a variety of things that, let's call it, shape our identity and our personalities and who we are. But I want to break it down a little bit. So in essence, what you need to understand is that we basically made up of three components in the way we function. The first component is our internal programming, but we also call the internal programming because it manifests in internal dialogue. Another name for it is thinking. Thinking comes from the foundation programming we have. And we need to understand how that programming develops. So when you get born, you enter this world as a baby. Your first thing to do is you want to learn to eat. You want to be fed. You want to be warm. You want to learn to communicate. Then we learn to move around a little bit. And slowly but surely, we develop as humans and we try and fit into society. We hopefully have a desire as a, as a young child still to become a part of society. And this usually happens within the first seven years of our lives. So in the first seven years, a huge amount of programs, if I can use that term, are installed in our brains. And they form a little bit of a blueprint that creates our belief system. So when we go through life, whenever we're confronted with something, we, we shape and form a belief around it. So at the moment, for example, with the war between um, US, uh, Russia and, and Ukraine, depending on what your initial programming was like, you most probably have formed some kind of a belief around it. Now, that belief creates internal dialogue. We think about these things. We say one thing from one side of the brain, we say something else from the other side of the brain. So we've got a clear understanding around that. The, the programming that's installed the first seven years is not cast in stone. Very often we have events, we have things happen in our lives, we have epiphany moments, we meet wise people, we learn new things, and we start altering, changing, and improving that program. So we're not born, grow up till seven, programs installed, and now it ends. Those programs are constantly being altered, changed as we become aware of them. And it is in the internal dialogue, this is something we need to understand. It's in the internal dialogue. Another name for it is our thoughts. It's the tool we use to reprogram our blueprints. Our thoughts dictate those programs, influence those programs, sometimes either strengthen or sometimes weaken them, sometimes completely flip them over to something completely else. It's the internal dialogue that is, I always want to say, responsible for that. Does it make sense? It's, it's the food that feeds the shift in our, our programming and our beliefs. From there, we have a secondary category. I said there's three elements. The internal dialogue is the first element. The second element is our external behavior. It is the doing of things, the actions, our behavior. Now, any behavior that's repeated, any behavior that's repeated becomes a habit. The reason is the brain loves programs, the brain loves repetition, the brain doesn't want to have to think about it, and it goes into unconscious capable functionality. It becomes a habitual default behavior. The only time we really start looking at our own behaviors is when we go through a trial and error phase in life. In other words, we've done something, we're not getting the response or the reactions we wanted. It's worked in the past. All of a sudden, it's not working anymore. And then we go, well, maybe I should change it. It's very seldom that we just think about changing something. It's usually when there's a response, an external reaction that happens. Because of our action, we now have a reaction. And sometimes we don't like the reaction, and then we change our behavior. So <clears throat> in some cases, we grow up young, and we don't really communicate well as teenagers. In fact, a lot of teenagers are extremely rude, in my opinion. And we grow up and we get to a certain age where we act out our rudeness and we realize I'm not getting the response. I'm not getting the reactions. I'm not getting the same kind of things that my friends or my family, the way they reacted for two years ago when, we, when I was rude. You know, a young child will say, I'm thirsty. 
A little bit later in life, we go, I'm thirsty. Is there any water, please? We change the way we behave. How and what makes us change? The reactions we've been getting. If we start a job and the boss screams at us, screams at us the whole day, gives us written warnings, internally we go, okay, maybe I'm doing something wrong, and then we change our behavior. So behavioral change usually only comes when there's a reaction that we don't like. Make sense? That's the second category. The third element, internal strategy. Now, internal strategy is the brain creating some kind of a hypothesis, a plan. But it's driven, driven very much by feelings, how we feel. Now, the moment I say feelings, feelings and emotions are not exactly the same. Feelings is a result of emotions, states, responses, and representations. So our internal strategy is usually driven by how we feel. Sometimes I feel great, I've got a certain internal strategy. Sometimes I don't feel great, I've got a different strategy. Now, our strategy is designed or functioning mainly to support our values in life. So our internal strategy that's driven by our feelings is basically in place so that it can help manifest our values, so that we live up to our own value system. You see the split between values and beliefs here? Okay, now here's the problem. Here's our challenge as human beings. If I have an internal dialogue, and my internal dialogue, my, one of my favorite examples is going getting a gym contract, going to the gym. Internal dialogue, which is my thinking brain, says, I need to get fit, look healthy. I then go, I apply external behavior. I now act, I start going to the gym. I don't do it long enough to get into a proper habit. My feeling part says, but I like watching TV as well and being lazy. You know, I've worked so hard, I need a bit of me time. You know, I need to rest. My brain has worked hard, my body needs to rest. Now there's a conflict between the one part of me trying to uphold the values, the other part trying to sustain the beliefs. And right here in the middle, I've got behavior. And usually when that happens, we procrastinate, we do something else. We look for an alternative, we divert. We come up with a justification also known as an excuse or reason. We do something else. A hundred years ago, we as humans did not have this problem. Our lives were a little bit different. It was more simplistic. You woke up in the morning, you had a function to do the same function as your parents did. Your father was a carpenter. You became a carpenter. Your job was be a carpenter. Find someone in the village to marry, even if it's the ugliest woman, because there's only one available. She's right about your age. Her hips are wide enough. She's going to birth your kids. Marry her. End of story. There was nothing else. There was no TV to watch. There was no social media. The Kardashians weren't alive, and we, we didn't get influenced by other people's rubbish. Our belief system, our value system, and our actions were very easily aligned. At least someone decided to go to war, and then we had those internal conflicts. But that was basically the only time in life when we had these internal conflicts. The way our lives are structured now with a variety of choices and options we have available to us, we are struggling. We are struggling to have a belief system and have a value system, to have an internal dialogue, to have a feeling system and an acting doing system that are all synchronized moving in the same direction. That's called limiting beliefs and unwanted behaviors. That's the reason coaching and NLP exists. That's the reason if you get a post on social media, I'm doing a course, I need volunteers, people are going to volunteer. It's for no other reason but the conflict that's happening inside of them. Does that make sense? Here's the thing. The moment we have conflict, internal conflict as humans, the moment my belief system, my value system, and my actions are not synchronized, 
what we tend to do is we look for an answer on the outside. We don't look for the answer on the inside. We look at other people. So the type of person we look at is someone that we feel some form of alignment with. We look at people that we think are potential us. In other words, I look at a, I find a version of me that I could become in my future. And I try and emulate whatever they are doing. Let me take, make it practical. Johnny has got a job. Johnny is um, a programmer. Johnny earns a measly salary. He lives in a flat. He's got no girlfriend or boyfriend. And he's not too happy with life. But Johnny's got a friend. Marco. Let's give him a name. Marco runs an online store. Marco makes a lot of money. Marco has a beautiful house, a boat, a car, a girlfriend, and a boyfriend. Marco is, well, yeah, he doesn't care. Marco's like just got everything that Johnny is dreaming of. Marco's got a lot of time. He goes on holidays, takes photos, nice selfies next to the beach. Marco's living Johnny's dream life. Johnny is in conflict. Because Johnny believes that he's capable. Johnny believes that he's got talents. Johnny believes he's intelligent. Johnny believes he's got energy. But Johnny's job is boring and he's struggling with it. And his feelings are saying, I don't like this. So it doesn't work that hard and take shortcuts. So he's not earning a lot of money. And he gets, got fired three times in the last four years. So Johnny decides, I want to make a change in my life. I'm going to start an online shop. Because my friend Marco is doing it. And Johnny wants to be Marco. So he starts his online shop. Five years later, Johnny's still poor. He's working himself into a coma, hates his life, no girlfriend, no boat, boat, no big house. The plan that he applied didn't give him the same results as what Marco got. Where in life is the problem? The problem is quite simple. Marco looked on the outside for an answer. Instead, are fitting into his unique, authentic, authentic space of this world from the inside. He tried to emulate someone else, copy someone else, be someone else, be something else, instead of just realizing what is truly important to him. You see, what's truly important is using someone else's blueprint. Absolutely, Sean. Well, what's truly important, what we need to realize is we need to just quite simply find out what do we believe, what do we value, what's important to us, what do we want in this world? And then, you know what's the next easiest thing? I absolutely guarantee you, whatever is truly important to you is at your fingertips, is right in front of your eyes. It's one of the most easiest things for you to achieve in life and to do. Because whatever we want to achieve in life is aligned with our natural talents and gifts. See, Marco's talents and gifts were not the same as Johnny's. Marco had natural talents and gifts that understood how to run an online shop. Johnny didn't. You need, to, you need to fit in. Now, here's the problem with our natural talents and gifts. It's so obvious. It's so obvious that we don't see it. It's so simplistic that we believe for some silly reason no one's going to pay me for it. Now, I want you guys just to stop and think for a while. I was born in 1963. Now, some of you guys don't even, some of you guys can remember those years. Some of you guys got no idea how far back that was. In 1960, so I was a teenager in the early 70s. Now, imagine in the early 70s, I went to my father, who was a surgeon, and I said to him, Dad, you know what? One day, I'm going to talk into a camera, and people a thousand kilometers from me is going to listen to me. And for that, they're going to pay me money. That's how I'm going to make a living. What do you think my father would have done? <laughs> Slap against the head <laughs> with a wet fish. <laughs> yeah? Yes, yeah. Oh, of course. He would say, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? What's my natural ability and my gift? To take a concept, understand it, unpack it, and verbalize it. I am talking into a camera to people all over the world, and I'm making money from it. I'm making a good living from it. Why am I making a good living from it? 
because I took something that was right at the tip of my finger that I did naturally and extremely easy. Listen to my words. That I did naturally and extremely easy. That did not tire me out. That I could do for hours and hours in a day and loved it. And it didn't feel like work. And I honed it. And I honed it. And I honed it. And I tweaked it. And I fine-tuned it. And I found my uniqueness, my unique spot, my little space where I fit in. I don't fit into any other job. I've never read a job description except for what I do for a living right now. I went, mean, oh yeah, this is me. Every single, I've read a lot of job description. Every single job description I've read, I went, mm -mm. not me. Mm -mm. Not me. When I coach my client, is the reason I'm explaining all of this. I unpack their internal dialogue through questions so that they understand what they believe. I unpack their behavior and their actions through questions so that they realize what they do. I unpack their feelings, their value system, so that they understand what's truly important for them. Only then do I start coaching. Because if I just jump in, boot saddles and all, I'm coaching someone to achieve a goal in life that's not theirs, it's someone else's. It's Marco's, it's not Johnny's. That penny drop. You guys get that? Seriously, guys, you need to tell me. Did you get that? Because if you didn't, let me repeat the whole thing. You need to understand that it's critical. The differentiation between a mediocre coach and an extraordinary coach is this principle I just explained. Because if you're not going to follow this process, you're going to follow the same way as every other coach in the world, you are going to be just like every other coach in the world. Nothing's going to differentiate you from that. We just had a student that finished our um, course in January. In January, quite recently, yes? The other day. She did a session with a couple of guys in America. They're blown away. They're so, now, let me just explain. America right now is the second largest, or the where when it comes to coaching, per capita, the most people employ coaches. Netherlands at the moment is leading in the world. They employ the most coaches per capita. USA is second. So how many coaches are there in the USA? A lot. Have they got access to other coaches? Yes. Have they been exposed to experienced coaches? Yes. We're talking about a woman that finished the course in January, which year? This one. They want to fly a group of people from America to South Africa so they can be trained by Action Factory because they've never come across coaching like this. What was the differentiating factor? What I just explained. It's going to set you apart from all the other coaches. Every other coach is going to listen to the surface language. All right, I know what you want. Let's go for it. Let's coach. That's the differentiating factor. So, see why I'm trying to harp on this as important? 